Great job in, in worship this morning. Enjoy our guest and what, a, what an incredible talent she has. And thank you guys for being here. And uh, if you have your Bibles, you ready to get in the Word? All right, come on. If you have your Bibles, uh, open them to Ephesians chapter 3, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 3. Now Paul's letters are usually divided into two sections if you read them. It's pretty interesting how he writes. And the first section is generally really heavy on the doctrinal teaching side about truth and what, what we're to believe. And then the second section usually comes through and it talks more about the practical implications of all that he's just shared with us. And so it's more about the obedience side of it. And so today we come to the end of the first section, and it's a second prayer. Um, Paul prayed in chapter uh, 1, I think it was, and he prayed a prayer that, we're, that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened. And so it was a prayer about enlightenment. But in this second prayer, he, he talks about, he moves away from the enlightenment and our ability to understand, and he moves into enablement. And so this prayer is about um, the Lord like moving in our lives and enabling us and giving us, um, and, and enablement basically means giving someone the authority to do something. And so I am a, I'm a huge uh, NBA fan. Well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me restate that. I'm a huge Oklahoma City Thunder fan. Amen, brother. I know you are welcome here. Like if the Holy Spirit is welcome here, and Michael, you are welcome here because of that. I knew that about you. Someone told me, so I'm thankful to have a fellow Thunder fan in the, outside of the, my immediate family. But in um, growing up in Oklahoma, you know, you have, uh, like, for a long time, <laughs> there are two major events. Uh, well, I guess there was three. There's the State Fair. That's a major event, man. There was the National Finals Rodeo. Las Vegas took that away from us. And then there was the Oklahoma Sooners. And me and my buddies would sit around and dream. We'd play basketball. And we'd say, do you think we ever have a chance at having an NBA team? And I was like, no. <laughs> They're not coming here. Well, then Hurricane Katrina came through. And all of a sudden, the New Orleans Hornets were displaced. And they found a temporary home in Oklahoma City. And I bought season tickets because they were saying, man, we really need to make a good showing. We need to support if we're ever going to have a chance for an expansion team. And so I, Abby and I bought season tickets, and we had a ball um, going to the games. Well, it just so happens that I had a guy in my church who worked for the newspaper. And he would sometimes get press passes. And he said, hey, if you ever want, and he would get these for me for the OU games and, and things. And so it was uh, basically... Um, he said, if you go now, you have to either have a cameraman with you or you have to have a camera. <laughs> so, so he'd get me these passes, and I'd strap the old Nikon on, and I would be right down on the sidelines. <laughs> and so uh, he got these passes for me um, to go to a lot of the, the New Orleans games. And so we, we would go, and, and I would take a, a friend of mine, and, and we'd often take a video camera, and, and we would do all kinds of cool things. We actually, you know, we... We went into the locker room one time and interviewed players, uh, and so we just, you know, get down in there and just do it. One time, I wanted to know, I had one buddy, so I had my season tickets too, and so they were right above the tunnel where the visiting team would come out, and we, the, the Hornets were playing now Miami Heat, and Shaquille O'Neal was on the team at that time, and so... I could go anywhere with this pass. I mean, I could go in this one room, and they had to have food out, and I could eat the food. You got special parking. And so I told my buddy, like I said, you stay here in my seats. And I said, I'm going to go down, and I'm going to find the team, and I'm going to come out with the team just to see what it feels like. You know? <laughs> so I get down there, and um, the Shaquille O'Neal, like, he's got the whole Miami Heat around him. They're doing their little pregame thing. And I'm literally standing from here to the drum kit to him. And I'm just kind of watching like a, a good reporter would do, right? And, and so he does his thing, and I was like, man, and Shaquille O'Neal is a huge man. Like, you think he's big until you stand in front of him, and you're like, he is a giant. I, I literally, you know, I literally felt like I was staring at his belly button when I was next to him. Like, he's that big. And so they come, they come, they come going out, and so 
I just kind of get behind them and kind of follow them. So I don't want to see what it feels like. And then the crowd's like, some of the crowd is booing, you know. And, and, but obviously, the, we, we don't really have a team. We're supporting the Hornets. And, and so I turn around, wave at my buddy. But all kinds of fun and stuff like that. We'd sit, you know, where the guys sit right on the end um, where they would video, you know, the, the, you see them run into the video players, the video, video guys. We would sit right there on the court. Amazing. And uh, a couple of things I learned about NBA basketball. One is, geez, they are, they're rough in there. Like, they're rough in there. And nobody has a, a worse potty mouth in the world than Kevin Garnett. That dude, man, talks major trash, and he does not use nice words. But anyway, uh, so lots of fun, and, and, and that pass enabled me to do that. Like, I knew, like, that existed and everything, but I, without that pass, I was not enabled to go in all of those different places. It's like they were all there, but I had to have that special pass in order to get there so people look at my credentials and I could go anywhere in that uh, arena that I wanted to go. And so that, that's kind of what Paul is talking about when he moves from understanding to enablement. And he's like, we are enabled um, to access all of these things and to lay our hands on the spiritual wealth that God has for us. We've been granted that all access pass that enables us to do things in our lives that we could not do uh, without it. And so when we begin to break it down in in verse 14 of chapter 3, he says, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And so we see that he's starting in his, his prayer and he starts with describing his posture in prayer is that he's kneeling um, before the Father. Now, it's important to, to understand a posture in prayer. A lot of times people go, well, when I pray, what should I do? Should I kneel um, or, or should, should I bow my head? Well, the, the important thing about posture in prayer is not so much about your physical posture. We have prayers in the Bible. David prayed a certain way while he was standing. We have people kneeling. We have Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane on, on his face. We have all kinds of different prayers in the Bible. For me personally, when I talk to the Lord on a daily basis, I'm not kneeling. I don't have my eyes closed and I'm not being silent. I'm walking around like I'm just kind of walking around talking to the Lord because I have ADD. And if I try any other way, I just boop, I'm gone. And so that's what works with what works for me. When we talk about posture and you're trying to get concerned about the right posture and prayer for your own life, it's more about the posture of your heart. Is your heart kneeling before the Lord? Are you coming to a place where you understand who the Lord Jesus Christ is and that you are a servant of his and yielding in your life in that posture of your heart? That's what is more important than your knees. And now he talks about father. He says, I, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. There's 200, th- 200 interesting things to take away about the fatherhood of God. As creator, did we look at human beings and we say, well, all humans are children of God. That is true. Like that's, There's some truth to that. Because as creator, God is father of all. But as Savior and Lord, he is father of only those who who have given their lives to him and been born again in Christ. And so he says, man, every human has, has gotten its name from, you know, God as Father. But those of us who have received Christ as personal Savior, and Jesus himself said, if a man wants to see the kingdom of heaven, he must be born again. And when we are born again, we know, um, we know God as Father in an Abba sense. Abba, Father. He is he is like personal to us. We are in relationship with him. And so when we come to that place, then we're born again and we know him that way. And so as Paul starts this prayer, we see these two uh, very important things that he's very, you know, he's elaborated on and all the way up to this point in, in the three chapters that we've studied. Man, he's been hammering these things home about how we need to know him personally and experience that, that birth in Christ. Well, there are four parts in this prayer, and so they work like they're, they, they're connected like a telescope. Um, a telescope is connected. You know, have a lens, and then it extends another lens and another lens or mirrors or whatever. I don't know exactly how it works, but each one leads into the next. And so there are four parts of this prayer that we're going to unpack today and see how Paul is writing this letter to the church, and it would even apply to us. It's a general letter that is to be written to all churches throughout all times, and so it's, re- it's, it's written directly, if you will, not only to the Ephesians, 
but it is meant to be circulated among the church. And he even talks about, um, in some points, in all generations. And so that would even include us. And so he says, dear, dear church. And the first thing that he prays for is, dear church, I pray you are strengthened. Okay? And so I, like, I want to join with Paul in that. I want, to, I want to be a part of that strengthening. And I want to say to you, dear church, dear local OPCC, dear local church, Dear body of believers, I pray that you are strengthened. Look at what he says. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Okay, so he's saying, we learn a lot about prayer by looking at Paul praying this particular prayer. He's praying for strength for the inner man. And, and so as he does that, he, what, he, what, we're, what he's alluding to in the importance of that is when the inner man is healthy, the outer man is satisfied. Like when the inner man is in a right relationship with God the Father as not only creator but savior, and the inner man is healthy, the outer man is satisfied. And so like Paul says we, we need to really focus our prayers on the spiritual over the material. We need to focus our prayers on the spiritual over the material. This is a discipline we need to figure out because we often focus on the material. Lord, I I really want this job. Lord, I really need you to open this door. Lord, I really need you to provide this income. Lord, I really need this girl to like me. Right? Like, so we're praying all these different... That's all about the outer. Like, we need to be praying, Lord, I really need to be a person this girl can like. You know, right? I really need to be an employee that my company values, so I need you to strengthen the inner man in order that I can be all that you want me to be. And so we begin to focus on the inner man, and the outer man becomes satisfied. If we're always focusing on the outer man, we are just causing the inner man to suffer, and that's not the way this works. We have to be focused on the inner man. So the inner man first must go from death to life. This is what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 3 when he had the famous encounter with Nicodemus, and he said that a man must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. We know that we are dead in our sins and trespasses, that we've learned that. I think that was in chapter 1 or 2. Um, if not, I shared it from, from another book, but we are dead in our sins and trespasses. So we must, have to, we must go from death to life as an inner, in our inner being. And so the resurrection of Christ, is a, a, it is a truth that happens for us right now on, the, on this side of eternity. It happens for us as Christ is raised up in us and the inner man comes to life. We move from death to to life. When we're born again, something very powerful happens to us, and we need to understand that those on the outside of the kingdom, and we're not like looking at people on the outside of the kingdom and going, I'm better than you. This should cause us to do the exact opposite and realize, man, there's something going on in my life that a person who doesn't know Jesus, they, they're not aware of. Because when the inner man comes to life, we can now see, hear, taste, and feel spiritually. Like we can see things spiritually, we can hear things spiritually, we can um, feel things spiritually, we can even, as we sang about, taste things spiritually. Psalm 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Remember Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. Well, he wasn't literally talking about his, his literal flesh, he was talking about we must become the kind of people who are sustained By tasting the Lord himself, he is the bread of heaven, he is the bread of life, and he sustains us. And when we are born again spiritually and the inner man comes to life, we have the ability to hear, taste, and feel, and see with spiritual eyes, spiritual ears. This is why Jesus was always saying, you have um, eyes, but you cannot see. You have ears, but you cannot hear, because they were dead, And so he knew that in going to the cross and rising from the dead, he was going to give human beings the ability to see and hear and and, and feel and taste spiritual things. And so once we come to life spiritually, the inner man, we must, the inner man must be exercised, he must be cleansed, and he must be fed. Like the inner man has to be taken care of. And the, the, the devil, the enemy's strategy is to get us to focus on the outer man so much that we have no time for the inner man. But the inner man is the key. 
Like the inner man is the key to being satisfied as an outer man or woman. If we want to get things to work on the outside, we need to focus on what is going on on the inside. And so the outer man decays. <laughs> like he decays. I'll be 48 tomorrow. <laughs> like, I can't jump, I can't run like I used to, I, I can't lose weight very easy anymore, I'm decaying, that's my excuse, like I'm, I'm decaying, the outer man is going down, but on the inside, my inner man, like I feel like uh, <laughs> Benjamin Button, isn't that his name? I'm getting younger down there, but I'm getting more mature. You know, that's what stinks about the outer man is you learn all these things and then you kind of get to a place in life where you have some disposable income where you can do some things, but then you don't feel like you can do anything. But on the inside, it happens opposite. We learn some things, we mature, we're learning to, to do more, and the inner man is being strengthened and he's being renewed day by day as what the scripture teaches us is that, that we are renewed day by day. And so we have the Holy Spirit empowering us. And, and what that means is when the Holy Spirit empowers the inner man, it means our spiritual faculties, our sight, our spiritual sight, our spiritual ears, our spiritual understanding, our, our, our spiritual hearing, our spiritual tasting, all of our spiritual faculties are controlled by God. And that's why Jesus said you got to die to yourself every day. When you die to yourself, then Christ can live in you, and the inner man rises up. And so we are growing in the Word. We're growing in prayer. We're growing in worship because we're learning to yield to the Holy Spirit. And so we're yielding to the Holy Spirit, letting Him have His way. He's controlling all our spiritual faculties, and because of that, we are strengthened. And so He says, dear church, I pray that you are strengthened, and this is how it happens, is that you've got to come before the Father and focus on the inner man of your complete makeup. Then He says, dear church, I pray you are deep. Look at verse 17. Why, why is he, he having us focusing on the, the inner being? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love. Now, in this verse, Paul uses three pictures. They're dwell, they're rooted, and established or grounded. Some translations use grounded, some say, say established. And so as we unpack each one of those, there's some very interesting concepts that are coming out for us. First, dwell means to settle down and feel at home. We talked about this the other day, that to be a member of the household of, of faith. Remember we talked about that? When you're a member of the household, you, you have rights to the fridge. You kick your shoes off. Okay, so this, he's saying, dwell. It's to settle down and feel at home. Here's the kicker. It's not, are you at home with the Lord? It is, is the Lord at home in you? Like, can the Lord come and settle down in your life and relax? Are you still trying to drive the ship so much that you're keeping things disrupted? You're not a good host for the king who lives inside of you. He indwells us, but can he make himself at home because we have given up our rights to ourselves? That's what salvation is about. Salvation and lordship is about us yielding to the Father so much that Christ is at home inside of us and we become vehicles for him to accomplish his will here on the planet. And so I, I'm reminded of the story of Abraham and Lot. If you read in the book of Genesis, in the very beginning, God makes a promise to Abraham. And on one particular occasion, God shows up and visits Abraham. Now, in the Old Testament, God did not minister to people the same way that he does in the New Testament. In the New Testament, we have after the day of Pentecost and the Spirit is given because of the atoning sacrifice of Christ on the cross, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, now lives in us. God did not live in people in the Old Testament. It was all preparing people to receive how he would function on the planet. His master plan is that one day he would live inside the human being, but at this point in time, there's not even a temple. And so God would come, or he would send a, a, the, an angel to come, uh, to speak to a prophet or he would give visions to a prophet where a prophet would go into a trance and he would receive a vision from God and this is how God communicated to humanity. Anytime we see God showing up in the Old Testament, it is known as either a theophany where it's God the Father showing up in human form 
or Christophany, where Christ, God the Son, is showing up in human form. So in this one particular occasion, God the Father shows up to Abraham, and, and, and as he comes with these two angels, Abraham says, ah, let me put on a calf, let me roast a calf, and let me roast some bread. And he tells Sarah, get things in order, we've got company. And it's God. And God's, God hangs out with Abraham for a long d- day there. He spends time with him with these angels, and there's, there's an interaction, and God tells him, I'm going to destroy Sodom because Sodom has become so wicked. And, and Abraham's uh, nephew, Lot, is in, in, in Sodom, and he's worried about him. And so he begins to try to plead with God. And, and so, the, you know, you could study this story, but here, here's, the, here's the connection I want you to see is after God spends the day with Abraham, he sends the angels to Sodom, and he does not go himself. And one very important takeaway for us of that story is that God felt at home with Abraham where he was dwelling, but not where Lot was at. God wasn't hanging out there. He was sending some angels to do his work in that domain. And so in the New Testament, we could look and see that, well, okay, God may indwell us when we come to know him, and he in fact does, but there is a difference in um, the Spirit of God being in me and walking in the fullness of the Spirit. We are Like when we become followers of Jesus, the Spirit of God dwells in us. But when we walk in the fullness of the Spirit, Jesus is coming out of us. And we're, that's the way we're supposed to live. That's why when we sing that song we sang today, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Like, like really what we ought to be saying is, is not thinking of the building itself, but thinking about you're welcome here. Holy Spirit, you're welcome right here. And, and I want you to have your way inside of, of, of my life. I want to yield to you. I want all of my spiritual faculties to be controlled by you, God, so that my body will do what you designed it to do and I can live in harmony with who you have created me to be. So, dear church, he says, I pray that you are deep. And he, he uses this word dwell to teach us about um, how to be a deep person is we have to welcome um, the Lord into our lives and, and allow, him, like, allow him to get comfortable. Now, how do you allow somebody to get comfortable? The bidding is all on the host. Let me get things ready. Do you need anything to drink? Like, are you comfortable? Here's the remote. I got some people coming over at my house today. You're not getting my remote. <laughs> but you understand, like, like, that's what it, like, we're giving the Lord all of that, making him comfortable. That's what we, we mean uh, by the, the Lord dwelling and filling at home in our lives. Then he uses the word. Rooted, rooted like a tree. The Bible often talks and describes, has a lot to say about trees. And one of uh, my favorite passages is Psalm chapter one, verses one through three. It's an incredible passage of scripture. And it says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord who med- and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Like I want some, like there, you were, that's prosperity preaching right there. What does prosper mean? It doesn't mean that you prosper financially. God may lay that out for you, and you may. But you, what you ought to be prospering in is your production of fruit as a tree that belongs to the Lord. And so the fruit of the Spirit ought to be produced in your life. The fruit of kindness and gentleness and, and patience and, and, and love. All of these things ought to be coming out of us because we are rooted in the Lord. And our roots must sink deeper into the love of Christ. And when our roots sink deeper into the love of Christ, we're able to experience um, Things that, whether things are great or things are difficult, we're in the place that we need to be because we are deep people. So, dear church, I pray you're strengthened. I pray you're deep. And the third picture he gives us is um, this word grounded or established. It's an architectural term that refers to foundation. And anytime you build something, my last church, we built a, a pretty large building. And they, they came out. And like, I was like, man, we've been raising money for four years. We're ready to see this thing get going. The first thing they did is they brought some dozers out and they moved some dirt and then it just stopped. And then they brought these big trucks out that would drill these 
cores down into the ground, and, and they send them off for soil tests. They just see what the soil is like. Nothing happening. It starts to get a little frustrating that you're not seeing any movement. But when you work with the architect, the architect will tell you, um, you cannot go high if you do not go deep. And so before we can ever get this structure out of the ground, we've got to focus on what is holding it up. And so Paul is saying, I, I pray that you are, are, are strengthened. I pray that you are deep because deep um, experiences sustain you through severe trials. And you're going to have severe trials. There would be probably some teachers that you could find that would teach the Bible and tell you that you're not going to have any severe trials, that you have enough faith and God is going to make your life perfect. That is unbiblical. It's just not biblical to teach that. Like, we, like You read about the disciples in the New Testament and their lives were not perfect. As I shared with you last week, um, uh, 10 of the 11 remaining apostles all were executed. That's not perfect. That's not peachy. And here are guys who knew the Lord personally. But what the Bible does tell us is when we walk through whatever experience may be, whatever the enemy may throw at us, whatever the fall may throw at us, our bodies may endure as a result of the consequences of the fall, we are able to walk in it and somehow walk victoriously with joy because it is a fruit of the Spirit. And when we are strengthened and we are deep people, it does not matter how difficult and severe the trial is, our experiences in depth will, with the Lord will sustain us through the midst of the trial. So dear church, I pray you're strengthened. Dear church, I pray you are deep. And then here he really amps it up. Dear church, I pray you apprehend this. Now look at verse 18 and, and the first part of 19. You may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. The word grasp here is the Greek word katalambano, and it means to grasp, to, to lay a hold of. Uh, it, it, it means more like we apprehend something. We apprehend uh, a person who's trying to escape. They are apprehended. Well, it's apprehending this idea of what Paul has just taught. And so comprehend means to understand, while apprehend means to lay hold of it for yourself. So comprehend would be for you to walk out of here and go, I get everything the teacher's saying today. But to apprehend is to own it. You don't just understand it. It becomes something that is a part of your life. It is possible to understand something and not make it your own. And so what are we to do? We are to grasp, get this, this is crazy what he says here. We are to grasp, we are to apprehend the width, the length, the height, and depth of God's love. Like we just get a hold of God's love. And the thing that he says is that this love surpasses knowledge. Like you can't understand it. You can't really know all of it in what it is. So you cannot measure it, but you can apprehend it. And that's good news for us. And so what is the result of all this? When, when we are strengthened, when we are deep, when we apprehend it, like when we get a hold of it, what is the result? The result is the big idea of today's talk. Dear church, um, fill up with the fullness of God. Look at what he says in the second part of verse 19. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, like, just, let's just think about that. Let's just, just try, to, let's try to grasp that. That you, church, may be filled to the fullness of God. Like, that's the way this thing's supposed to work, is that we are filled to the fullness of God. So positionally, once we, once we are born again, positionally, we are complete in him. Like we are saved. We know Jesus as Savior. But practically, we enjoy only the grace we apprehend by faith. Positionally, you can be secure in your salvation, but practically not enjoying anything about that salvation. And when you move from the position to the practicality of it all, then you're starting to understand that Jesus is not only Savior, He is Lord of your life. And when He becomes Lord of your life, you have practically started to live out what you are positionally. And so here's the deal, like I was given the pass. I had access 
to every place in the arena. So one Christmas, <laughs> the San Antonio Spurs were coming into town to play the New Orleans Hornets. Um, New Orleans, Oklahoma City Hornets. So me and my buddy were going to go down, the videographer at our church, and we're going to, this is going to be our day. We're going into the locker room today, bro. We're going to get interviews. <laughs> when you are not a reporter and you're going to go in and interview millionaires who are famous and you're just like a preacher, that's challenging. Like you got to like really own it. And so like we... You know, I can remember, here we are, we're walking around, we'd walk by the, we located the locker room, we'd walk by it, and I, man, I had to get my nerve up. I had the enablement, but I had to come to terms inside of myself that what was, had been enabled for me, I had to grasp it and get a hold of it. And I can remember it like it was yesterday. It's like, I, I kept telling him, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm getting closer, bro. I'm getting closer. Because i got to think of questions on the fly. I've got to get these guys to say. We're going to interview them as reporters and try to get them to tell us the greatest gift that they ever had gotten. And so we go in, and, and I finally I said, all right, we're going in. We open the door, boom. And Chris Anderson, I don't know if you know Chris Anderson. He's the bird man. He's crazy. So I asked him, I said, what's the greatest gift you've ever gotten, ever received? Uh, you know, I asked him a couple things about the game to kind of get me in and make me look professional. And then I said, what's the greatest gift you've ever gotten? He said, a pack of socks. I was like, great. This is going to be great for church. What's the greatest gift you've ever given? A pack of underwear. And I was like, okay, let's move on to the next guy. Uh, but anyway, the, 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 what was funny is uh, just a couple of years ago, he was playing for Miami. They interviewed him, ABC, and they asked him about the greatest gift, and he said he got a pack of socks. I said, it was good work, Jimmy, good work. <laughs> um, but here's the thing, is that I had to come to a place in my life, in that experience, that even though I was enabled with the press pass, I had to get a hold of it and grasp it and let it take me into the locker room and do what it had enabled me to do. When we do that in our faith, there's a natural, like, like <laughs> the Spirit of God just breaks out. Now watch what happens. Paul, many uh, theologians will say that when Paul is writing Ephesians, he's having like almost an out-of-body experience. The Lord is just opening up his mind, and it's a brilliant theological work. Like It's like God allows him to see how the whole thing works, and we, he writes it down. And here we are thousands of years later talking about it. And so he, as he's in this prayer, and he's praying, Dear church, I pray that you are strengthened. Dear church, I pray that you are deep. Dear church, I pray that you apprehend this. Dear church, I pray that you, br you are filled with the fullness of God, all of a sudden in chapter 20, he breaks out in praise and he says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Like he's praying for us, like the Lord just, boom, he just breaks out in, in Paul's life. And we see these two words, energia and dunamis, the spiritual energy of God and the spiritual power of God, and we are to lay hold of that, and when we do, we realize the Lord has enabled us, and the Holy Spirit releases the resurrection power of Christ in our lives, and so our job as believers is to plug into the power and practically live out our position in Christ. The church is anemic because the believers aren't plugging in and living out practically what they are positionally so that the praise of God is bursting forth and that they realize I'm able to do immeasurably um, um, of all, God does more immeasurably more than all I could ever ask or think. Jesus said this in John chapter 15, verse 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. In Philippians 4.13, Paul says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Dear church, be full of God this week. Let him rise up in you. Let him strengthen you. Let him make himself at home in your life. Yield to the Holy Spirit. Some of you need to yield to baptism. Dear church, I pray that you are strengthened. I pray that you are deep. I pray that you let Jesus 
dwell in you and make himself at home. Yield. Some of you need to yield to the Lord. He's asking you to to, to do away with some relationships in your life that are influencing you negatively. And he says, you you need to yield to him at that. Let him make his self at home. Whatever he's asking you to do, yield to it. And you will find that you can be filled with the fullness of God. That God doesn't just live in you. He fills you. 